Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast, providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. I recently joined as a member, and you can too. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. And when you go to apply and they ask you, how did you hear about Podgo? Make sure you tell them that the Vault Classic Music Review sent you. Welcome to the Vault Podcast. Classic Music Reviews. Presented by IV Creative. Now, here's your hosts, B. Cox and the crew. Greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Vault Podcast. Classic Music Reviews. Presented by IV Creative. It's a perspective on the classics from a fresh point of view. We appreciate you for taking your time and lending your ears to our perspective. You could be anywhere listening to anything, but you're right here with us, so we thank you. With you today is yours truly, B. Cox, and with you, of course, I have my boy, Cousin Damo, a.k.a. Dominique Marks. He is the host and creator of Raw Sex Podcast. You can listen to it on all of your streaming platforms. Of course, it comes out every Thursday or Friday. Make sure you are checking out for it actually just put out not too long ago as of this recording part number one of call me mr nice guy so (laughs) it's definitely an entertaining conversation we appreciate all of you who go out and listen to it and for those of you who don't go out there and subscribe to my man's show go ahead and follow him on social media you can get him on raw sex podcast on ig and on twitter you can get him on raw sex podcast one go ahead look him up follow us and follow the show go ahead and tell us what you think so, of course, our motto here on the, the Vault Classic Music Reviews is hashtag open the vault, hashtag nothing but the classics of NBTC. And today, we're going to take you all the way back to the year 2000, 20 years ago, mm. back down to Atlanta and to the fourth studio album by Outkast, to the land of Stankonia. And <laughs> released October 31st, 2000. 20 years ago, the fourth studio album by Outkast. This was really, to me, even the last true album they did as a cohesive unit before they went into, well, they did a couple of albums after this, but I think to me, this is really where I draw the line of demarcation where I really look at Outkast truly as a unit where they were functioning and highly functioning as a unit. The other two, the Speaker Box and Love Below and Ottawa, uh, the Speaker Box and Love Below to me is really just a, two sets of this big boy and a Dre album or a 3000 album. And then out of wild is more so based on a lot of things with the movie. And as a lot of people know, mistake, I consider that to be their worst album overall, but here it is. Stankonia Damo, October 31st, 2000 recorded between 99 and 2000 was recorded at what was once called the boss town recording studio in Atlanta and A&M studios in Atlanta now, Boss Town Recording Studio used to be owned by none other than Bobby Brown. They bought the studio and they renamed it Stan Coney Recording Studios. So, and the Boss Town Studio is actually where the Outcast recorded a few of their albums, everything leading up to Stan Coney. Yeah, it became their own studio and it's still their studio to this day. So, long time of 73 minutes and seven seconds on, of course, LaFace Records. Executive producers on the album actually outcast themselves as Earth Tone 3. And, you know, Earth Tone 3 Damo is the trio of Outcast and Mr. DJ, who was Outcast Road DJ. They formed this production company and also this group called the Earth Tone 3. Additional production done as well by the iconic Organized Noise. Three singles here from Stankonia, of course, B.O.B. or Bombs Over Baghdad, Miss Jackson, and So Fresh and So Clean. And all of them were hits. Very, very big hits. Um, yeah, they was. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I can't remember any album that we've done in recent memory, at least this year, that have had three singles that have come out that have been smashes. Smashes. <laughs> yeah. I can't. You know what? You're right. I can't think of any. any and, and they're like cultural smashes. Yeah. Because you... I'm sorry, Miss Jackson. Yeah. Ooh, that, was, that, yeah. Yo, that was still, that's still the Jones. Yeah, exactly. And then so and then, fresh and so clean. Fresh I mean, so, <laughs> yeah, those are just, 
<laughs> yeah. So Fresh and So Clean was the first video that I actually saw with, that I saw Cat Williams in. You know what I'm saying? Like he was in that joint. Mm-hmm. And like, so, and to talk about Stanconia, this really to me was like the first album that Outkast really started to step out into the forefront to be like, okay, well, they started self producing with AT Aliens in 1996. They took a big role in producing with Equemni, which came out in 1998. But at this point, you could really start to see their footprint and you really start to see them start to spread the limits of creativity. Just some of the accolades that this album received. Miss Jackson was the first, their first single that was on the Billboard Hot 100. They won the Best Rap Album of the Grammy Awards in 2002. And then the Best Rap Performance by a duo on a group from Miss Jackson. On a few lists, Rolling Stones on their 500 Greatest Albums of All Time gave it number 361. They have a reissue getting ready to come out on the 20th anniversary, which comes out later on this week. Now, <laughs> this album, yeah, man, it's to to me, it's no secret that as we know, when it comes to rap groups, Outkast is right up there with Tribe Called Quest for my favorite rap group of all time. I think that their catalog to me speaks for itself. And I think quality wise, I don't think there's a rap group out there that can compete with Outkast. They probably got the best quality. Yeah. I the mean, that's catalog group wise. Exactly. And I don't, and not even Tribe Called Quest. And yeah, not even Tribe. Yeah. And so, not even Wu Tang. Yeah, not Wu Tang. So, yeah, it's it, to me, I think they have the best catalog. And this is just yet another jewel in that catalog. But we'll go back, man. We'll go back to 2000 just to sort of, I'm going to get your perspective on what you thought about the album when it first came out. And then now, after listening after all these years, what you still think about it and what kind of things it brings back to you listening to it this week. Oh, it's so. 31st. Oh, another album when you, your ass done left off mm-hmm. the Morgan. Yeah. My ass in Senior Lounge, which I've been there since like sophomore year. Ain't nothing new <laughs> being in <a> Senior Lounge. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nigga, it's supposed to be there. It was already there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Playing spades and shit. But I'm mm-hmm. there by myself, of course, you know. The same crew that you left, we back there talking about the album. You know, that, you know, they don't drop on Halloween. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got to go get that. So, you know, we go get it. Listen mm. to it. Then it was like you know, they all over the place. Mm-hmm. That's I say they sound just like them wild and all over the place, but the lyrics is, you know, there. So I'm like, all right, so you gotta listen to it again. Like, all right, now you gotta real you really gotta pay attention because if you if you just trying to listen to the music, you ain't mm-hmm. gonna understand nothing they saying for real, or catch the slick shit they say, mm-hmm. or the, the clever shit they say. You like so yeah. you listen to it again, like all right, okay. All right, all right, I see y'all. Mm-hmm. All right. So back then it was like it was like all right, this is a good album. It's a good album. I said all right. Now I listen to it this week. And, you know I listen. It's I'm not a smoker, so you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I remember being a smoker. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember this album as something you could ride around, listen to, and I think that's just about what I think that's the vibe they give yeah. for some reason. Yeah. To where they want you to get high and listen to their music. Exactly. So I, you know what? I think I can't feel it the same way sober, like the way I did when I was high. Mm-hmm. But it's still a good album. It's just it, it's just a whole different, a whole different energy when you're in that joint, mm-hmm. high as a kite. Yeah. And, it's, and now, oh, when I come, yeah, do, yeah. Do, 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 yeah. Like. <laughs> Yeah. Now it's like, oh, I call when I like, oh, I call before I call. Like, all right. But when you high, it's like, I yeah. call when I call. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, was def- it definitely it definitely went right through. It wasn't like one of them old albums where, it would, you know, you feel like it's forever. Mm-hmm. And, oh, damn, let me stop. Hey, I can't get through this show. Oh, shit. Yeah. Now, for me, as you mentioned, this had dropped right when I was in Morgan and these singles as they dropped, dropped right around the time when I was starting school and they came back to back to back. And the big thing was like the first thing I mentioned was like being able to listen to a song like Bombs Over Baghdad, which came out. Actually, the single of those has been out way before I'd even got to Morgan. And then Miss Jackson was just such a big hit. And then the video that followed up behind that and the imagery from the video with the owl <laughs> and mm-hmm. everything like, you know, outcast in their videos used to kind of always, yeah. especially later on in their tenure, used to always kind of give you that feeling like where they were taking, like I said, the limits of creativity and they were stretching the limits of creativity. And the imagery is really what kind of helped bring you in and help give you a visual for the song. Listening to this when it came out, I had friends that listened to uh, Stankonia and the album for me, even back then, was like the more that I listened to it, 
the more that I liked. And Mm -hmm. I think I walked into this kind of thinking like, okay, their last album was a Quemni. I don't know how much better they can do from that. And when I listened to it and when I got a chance to fully digest it, like like you said, if you just listen to the music and don't pay attention to the lyrics, that's why I had listened to it a few times. I had listened to it probably seven, eight, nine, ten times before I kind of fully encapsulated everything and was like, oh, okay, I get it now. Mm-hmm. Now, after I was done, I was just like, okay, I don't know if this is better than a Quemna, but damn, this shit is sure pretty close. It's mm-hmm. pretty close, and it's a, it's a damn good body of work. What I noticed when I was listening to it even back then is that I saw that their level, that their creativity was being stretched, but then their levels were starting to go up as far as when you saw that they had control over their music. I think at yeah. this point, you really started to see where the idea of Speaker Box and the Love Below came around because you started mm-hmm. to see that divide between the two of them as far as like stylistically. Mm-hmm. To me, mm-hmm. I thought on this album, Dre is always, always excellent, always exceptional. It's like almost with every one of Outkast albums, Big Boy took another step up, you know? Like from Southern Playalistic to AT Aliens, took a step up. From AT Aliens to Aquemna, took a big step up. From Aquemna up to Stanconia, then it was like, all right, man. Yo, my dude is really starting to find himself and really getting, like, not that he wasn't good before, but he really, to me on this, just kind of just really stepped up. And then listening to it now, I know exactly what you're talking about when you said the whole smoking factor, right? Like the whole being intoxicated with whatever it is that you are and being able to vibe mm-hmm. to this, right? Which is crazy though, because it's like, you know, with Dre, at this point, he wasn't smoking or drinking anymore. I do understand that thing of it, but even now, like not being med- medicated, listening to it just, just most recently this past week, did I feel that same sensation? No, but I think I was still mm-hmm. able to listen to the music and be yeah. like, yeah, man, like this is. Like, this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? I think I had listened to this album in some time. Like, if I go to listen to an Outkast album, this is probably not on my top list of the ones to listen to. I'll probably listen to a Quemna and Southern Playalistic before I listen to this mm-hmm. one. But but listening to it, I just kind of got a nice little reminder. Like, yo, this is... And then to me, what I love about the fact without these Outkast albums from this era is that when it came to like organized noise and the dungeon family, when people had projects, they all came out and contributed. So mm-hmm. that's what I love is that to me, when the dungeon family did things with organized noise, and outcast and goody mob and whoever else, it was slim cut a Calhoun or a cool breeze or Calhoun. yeah, cool breeze, better you know, than the champ. The champ, right? Exactly. <laughs> to me, when they all went to down to big rube and society of soul and joy, when they all collaborate, that's when I think they've made their best music. You know, when the Dungeon family is together contributing to make somebody's project work. And when if you looked at the documentary, which was the sound of the art of organized noise, which was about organized noise and the rise of the Dungeon family, is that that's how they they got where they were. Because everybody contributed on someone's project. Like if somebody Mm -hmm. was coming out, everybody stepped up to contribute to that project to make it work. And that's just another idea with Stankoni. And at this point, everybody in the Dungeon family had already reached a level of some sort of you know, notoriety. They had all had projects and been and done projects before. And at this point, we're on their second and third projects. So they had it all figured out, but I love it. I love the fact that Earth Tone 3, which is Dre, Big Boy, and Mr. DJ decided to produce so much of this album. But I love the contributions from Organized Noise on here too. I love being able to hear almost every group member from Goody Mob on here as well. Then to see the guest spots, like Be Real, and Erica yeah, Badu. That one threw me, that one threw, oh, that, that, that Erica Badu joke made sense. Yeah, I know, of course. <laughs> but yeah. That be, but that be real joke. I was like, I had to look. I was like, what mm-hmm. the hell? Yeah, be <laughs> real. Be real. From Cypress Hill. And you know something yeah. crazy? Because, you know, I got titled or whatever. Because mm-hmm. I had I, one of the albums when we was doing the Jay Z and not, you know, they didn't have all of Jay Z Jones. So mm-hmm. I ended up getting on title. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When the album finishes, it keeps going to like a playlist, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the album finished and it went to a CeeLo Green song, right? Mm -hmm. But it felt like it was a part of the album. Yeah. So I had to stop. I was like, hold on. Is this still (laughs) Outkast? I'm like, hold on. I said, hold on. I pulled the phone phone out because I was working out at the time. So I pulled the phone out. Look, I said, I said, oh shit, this show done went into it. I said, if I didn't know any better. Yeah. 
I would have just kept going. I ain't even thinking it, right. that it wasn't on Stankonia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because <laughs> then I said, oh, shit, well, let me go back and restart the album over again. I said, oh, shit, that shit just threw me off right there. Mm-hmm. I said, but the music was, you know, still hand in hand right there. Yeah. It's the sound, man. That mm-hmm. sound that they come to cultivate it. Like that period of things with that first generation Dungeon family. Like they really were in, a, they really were in a groove musically and in tune with each other musically. But also, like Big Gip said during the documentary, is that Outcast stuff didn't necessarily sound like Goody Mob stuff. You know, Goody Mob stuff didn't sound like stuff that, you know, Cool Breeze was putting out or Witch Doctor. And everybody sort of felt fit in. Everybody fit in. But the great work on this, the lyrics, like you said, if you don't catch what they're saying on some of these things, it might fly right over your head. And you definitely see that on a couple of tracks on here. And I'll mention a couple of them coming up. And just being able to hear, like the one thing I love about Outkast albums is you get some samples, but for the most part, what you get in is badass musicians in here just playing their asses off, like live instruments, being in the studio, jamming, and it's like shit be so funky. And it's like, that's when you get that sound or whatever you listen it to. So what really, what I love is the fact that you don't really get too many samples on here, but you get great music because it seems like, Dre and Big Boy took that whole thing with Organized Noise did with bringing in musicians to be able to produce these beats. They did the same exact thing on this one. So, yeah, man, I still love it. I still love it, and it still is a vibe nowadays and still in within the standard deviation of what you're going to get from Outkast. So now we're going to get into highlights, lowlights, what you liked, what you didn't like, and just, Domo, if you could give me an idea just of some of your highlights on uh, the album. Of course. The singles are the high, high highlights. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't really get no more. You can't yeah. get no more higher. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So besides that, I like the, the John with Erica Badu. Mm-hmm. Fumble Mumble. Mm-hmm. Right? Of course, you got the interludes. Mm-hmm. All the skits. Yes. <laughs> Kim and Cookie interlude. <laughs> I thought I was going to give my like, bang no. out. <laughs> right. came up short. It, what? I was mm-hmm. like, oh, these motherfuckers wild. I forgot yeah. them. This was the back in the time where, you know, skits was prep. You see a lot of skits on Jones, yeah. but, you know, they don't really. That Slum Beautiful Jones with mm. uh, CeeLo. Yeah. I love that Jones. Woo. Yes, sir. Gangsta shit. Mm hmm. Yes. Right. Of course, I'll call before I come. Yeah. <laughs> that <won't> just come. <laughs> hey, look, that's an important message in that song, man. For real. You know? Hey, you might go to something you ain't supposed to be seeing. You'll yeah. call before you come. Um, exactly. Shit. Yeah. I was like, I started dying laughing when I heard that joke. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's it's basically how you how you always break it down when you talk about, to me, it seems... And you always say, like, the album, once it get in this groove, yeah, it takes off. It takes off, And yeah. I feel like right after you go past I'm Cool in the Lose, So Fresh, So Clean, mm-hmm. it takes off. It takes right off. Right So Fresh, So Clean, that's right when it take off. Yeah. Boom, right through the album. hmm Yeah. So my highlights. I actually, you know, the singles as well, but then, like, I did, like, Gasoline Dreams. I love all the tracks on here produced by Organized Noise, though. And so the tracks produced by Organized Noise are, of course, the single So Fresh and So Clean. Spaghetti Junction might be, just might be my favorite non-single track on here Uh, because it reminds me of that sound that you get from Organized Noise, like real funky, real soulful. And, of course, the last one is We Love These Hoes, (laughs) which is... (laughs) Right. Explosion would be real. I thought it was cool to have be real on something like this. Um, yeah, you know, different. yeah, it different. Uh, and it, it, it fits them for real. How they, you know, mm, different, different. Yeah, uh, like you said, love slum beautiful. Uh, love the red velvet. I actually think the the message in red velvet, I think, was great. The song that a lot of people kind of like, I was miffed at first when I got it. It took me like three or four times to listen to it back in the day. Was toilet tissue and the <laughs> message behind toilet tissue though was really where well, I was just like, whoa, okay, so that's what they were talking about. You know, it's the messages. It's like you get these messages in outcast songs and the things that they use, the title's going to set you aside and be like toilet tissue, you know? Like they, they toilet mm-hmm. tissue, but like, no, you're talking about tissue. Like every single outcast album you have, you always have that long instrumental track. On Southern Playlist, it was Funky Ride. On ATLNs, it was the 13th Floor. On the Quemni, it was Spodio the Dopalicious. 
And they continued the, tr- the tradition with Stankonia, a.k.a. Stank Love. And with that, you had Society of Soul, mostly Sleepy Brown singing on it. But then you had that poem by Big Rube in the middle of it, too. And it's just something that you could just vibe out to, just like Funky Ride, just like Spodio de Dopalicious, just like 13th Floor. And this is another one of my favorites. It's like I love when they get together and they have a real funked out track and just something that you can ride to just chill out to. And if you smoke, hey, that's what you do. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. Um, the interludes are definitely a high point as well because they're hilarious, especially the one with prenup. When he was like, hey, baby, can will you marry me? He's like, yes, I got one more question for you. You signed this prenup to agreement. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh what? man, yeah. <laughs> this is um, this is outcast to me at the peak, and you know, like you said, the album sort of just kind of takes off. Like right at, right after you get into so fresh and so clean, you go right through that entire album. You just kind of go through, and this runtime, a runtime of seventy three minutes and seven seconds. That's a that's longer than an hour. It doesn't really feel like it though when you're listening really to it. It, it really doesn't. Did. You know, some albums you listen to, they only be like 50-something minutes long, but they feel like they drag on forever. This is 73 minutes long. It doesn't feel like it takes that long, you know? Mm, that's so. what I said. Like, they went into, when it went into the new song, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, the album over? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, it went to the end of Stank Love, and it's just, that's the that's the end of it. Three songs only on here have samples and interpolations. It's so fresh and so clean. Miss Jackson and We Love These Hoes. That's it. Everything else is pretty much live instrumentation, original beats, man, which is amazing considering that there's 24 tracks on here. Take away the interludes, probably about 18 tracks on here. You know, so to me, I think that's more so even impressive as well. And oh, yeah, of course, I love Humble Mumble as well, because you kind of get to see that Erica Badu, you know, influence in there, which is to me, I think is also funny because at this point, you kind of always thought that like they both had albums that came out this year. I mean, Dre and, and Erica. And they both had songs on each other's albums that kind of talked about each other. Not kind of, they did talk about each other. Mm -hmm. With Outkast, it was Miss Jackson. (laughs) And with Erica Badu, it was Green Eyes on Mama's Mm -hmm. Gun. She was definitely talking about Andre on that. I mean, people Mm -hmm. would say, oh, no, she was talking about Andre on that. (laughs) So, yeah. So, to me, I think when you get an album that can float like that, it it kind of really also to me tells me that they have finally learned from Rico and Sleepy and Ray from Organized Noise how to be able to take over their direction and how to sequence an album and everything mm-hmm. because they learned. I mean, that was the biggest thing I think for all their albums. Their albums are always sequenced, like think, perfectly. When you say that, you could tell who came from under them. Like think yeah. about how Future does his music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was in that camp. Yeah, when you listen to Future albums, it's the same way. Yeah, mm-hmm. like once it hit that, once it he he always had the albums done right. The sequence is always perfect mm-hmm. for some reason. Yeah. Like, oh shit! All right. Yeah. Well, shoot, futures Rico. Right. Yeah, f- f- futures uh, Rico's uh, little cousin, man. So you know, uh, Rico, mm-hmm. Rico Wade, that's his little cousin. So you know, future is considered to be a second generation Dungeon family member. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you know what I'm saying, but. Yeah, hey man. So now we're going to get to notable quotables. So um, if you have one, Damo, you go ahead and let everybody know what your notable quotable is. I was going to go, of course, with the super single at mm-hmm. first. I said, mm-hmm. you know, sorry, Miss Jackson. I mm-hmm. was like, uh, mm-hmm. you know. Wifey name is Jackson. Her last name is Jackson. She said, I, I hate that song. That used to always make fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to do it just to throw a shot at her to let her know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to yeah. keep it go. But then... I kept on going back to Humble Mumble. Mm. And I was like, nah, I'm not, I'm going to go right mm-hmm. in the Humble Mumble with Big Boy. Okay. Now you switching while you quitting because it's heated in the kitchen. Sloppy slipping and you're pimping, nigga. You either pistol whip the nigga or you choke the trigger. You got to follow through, struggle to complete your dreams. No weapon to form against Prosper, 5417. Mm. From Isaiah, lay a nigga down and spray him. If the dealer dealt a fucked up hand of cards, you got to play him. Mm. And then, of course, it go into the chorus. I was like, oh, shit. Like, yeah. I had to go back and listen to him say it again. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, shit. I said, damn. 
I forgot Big Boy was giving it up a mm-hmm. little bit. Yeah, man. But I, said, Dang. I tell people, man, Big Boy to me, I think he improved almost every single album. Yeah. Like every single album, he got better. And I think this is at a point where you start to like really notice. Be like, dude, you really stepped up. Like all these years, you've been stepping up and we haven't paid you enough attention. We're sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm real. actually yeah, so I'm actually gonna go with Miss Jackson, and it's because I think I was listening to this, and I got I was reminded just how much this verse struck me. Not only then, but even a few years ago, and I even made one of the lines one of my Facebook statuses. So, of course, Dre says, you know, ten times out of nine, now if I'm lying, fine. The quickest muzzle will throw it on my mouth, and I'll decline. King meets queen, then the puppy love thing together. Dream about that crib and the good year swing. On the oak tree, I hope we feel like this forever, 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 ever, forever, ever. And this is the part that I use in my Facebook status. Forever never seems that long until you're grown. And notice by the day by day ruler can't be too wrong. Miss Jackson, my intentions were good. I wish I could become a magician to abracadabra all the sadder thoughts of me, thoughts of she, thoughts of he asking what happened to the feeling of her and me had. I pray so much I had. We had some knee pads. It happened for some reason. I can't be mad. So know this, that everything's cool. And yes, I'll be present on the first day of school and graduation. But that line right there. <laughs> hey, and I was going to use that same one yeah. too. <laughs> that that line right there. Mm-hmm. Forever never seems that long until you're grown. Mm. I mean, mm. Dre has a way of being able to get these lyrics out here that that really stick to you. And to me, that one out of any out of all the other ones that I think and most of the albums up to that point really means a lot. I mean, cause like even now, like he went to forever, never seems that long until you're grown. Cause when you kids, you always talk about some yeah. stuff like this and forever. And then you don't really mm-hmm. understand it till what forever is until you're grown and, uh, and aware mm-hmm. of the concept of time of time, money and energy. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, well, mm-hmm. damn forever. Never seems that long until you're grown. Mm. Wow. So, there we are. And and now just to sort of talk about like with this album, it's how many we talked about some of the accolades. Now, the influence and the legacy that this has had, like to me, I think this is probably and this is mentioned in one of the articles about what it did as far as the Grammys are concerned. At the 2002 Grammys, this won best rap album. They won best performance by duo group for Miss Jackson. And they were actually the favorite that year to win the album of the year for uh at the grammys which is one of the i think one of the two or three biggest awards that they named that night instead of winning that one the academy the recording academy the grammys they picked the old brother where art thou soundtrack instead of outcast being nominated for that people thought they were the favorite now some people complained afterwards that they didn't think that it got the props that it needed but what the backlash from that was is that the academy themselves started looking at more hip-hop albums and saying oh we can, you know, name it. We've already done it once, you know, for the hip hop album. At that point, Lauren Hill had won uh, record of the year. I think it was two, three years before. Eventually, what this did is set the table for when they came out with Speaker Box and Love Below. Mm-hmm. Two years later at the Grammy, they won album of the year in the Grammys. And they took away, I think, like six or seven, six Grammys that night <laughs> when they won. To me, I think that's where Outcast Legacy is, is they started at such humble beginnings in the basement of 1907 Lakewood Terrace, Southeast Atlanta, in the dungeon, and took it all the way to the Grammys where they won, I think it was Record of the Year and also Album of the Year and one of the biggest awards of the night. When you look as far as, like, the best album. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, the South got something to say. Exactly. Dre said it during the South, during the Source Awards. And (laughs) as far as best albums of the year, like, Tom named it one of the best, uh, 100 best albums of all time. Rolling Stone ranked it as 16 on the best albums, 16th on the best albums of the 2000s. And Pitchfork named it 13th on the best albums of the 2000s. Rhapsody named it the number two album on the 100 best albums of the decade from 2000 to 2009. Janelle Monet even stated that this and its experimental nature was an influence for her. Pill, rapper Pill, said that it was an influence. Also, Rage Against the Machine helped to do a remix of Bombs Over Baghdad like so many different people looked at this album and it influenced a lot of things as far as when it came to hip hop culture. Like you can even say a lot of the new artists and acts in Atlanta. You can even start, like you say, with Future and even artists that came afterwards like Gucci Mane and Jeezy 
and even the artists like Shorty, uh, um, what's what's his name, Shorty Low, and all these other rappers from Atlanta, like mid two thousands, definitely got their influence from this album. You can hear it in their music. You know what I'm saying? So uh, legacy and influence wise, to me, I think it's even bigger than the sound and how great the quality of the album it is. So, yeah. and then the album cover. <laughs> like I've seen so many spoofs on that album cover with t-shirts and everything else. I even saw someone when black Panther came out, there was a spoof of this with Killmonger and black Panther on it with black Panther being pretty much in the same position. Like big boy is and Killmonger being in the position where Andre is with his hands out with his hair and everything. So, so now we're going to get to the test, the ultimate test of time. We're going to see what you think it is. So Damo, what say you, is this a certified classic, borderline classic, a classic in its time, or not a classic at all? It's definitely a classic in its time. It's right there, borderline certified classic to me because I don't feel like it's mm-hmm. their best album. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to hold it to its best, and which is a great thing that you could say that, mm-hmm. if I'm going to hold it to their best album and I'm not going to give you a certified classic, that means you done put a hell of a lot of work out. <laughs> Mm -hmm. A good workout. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, for me, it's a certified classic. And I say it's a certified classic because we looked at just basically not only the legacy and influence, but the success that it had. I mean, this is something that when it came out, we're talking about rap doesn't get any, didn't get any respect. Back then, rap really didn't get any respect at the Grammys. Like even Lauryn Hill's album, while it was dubbed hip hop, it was mostly R&B and Neo soul in nature. So it was a little bit soft to the to the critics' ears. Yeah. This was not as soft to the critics' ears, but yet True. they still accepted True. it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like there True. aren't many hardcore rap albums that have went out there that have actually won album of the year. And not only that, but I think the fact that they were able to stretch a little bit of creativity and go in a little bit of a different direction than they did from where the, from Equemna and even from AT Aliens when they had super big success and they were still able to appeal to an audience and their audience still loved them for it. And the fact that we're coming up 20 years from now and we can look at this album and look at its place at the time that it was at and be like, now even 20 years later, we can turn this on that still hasn't dropped quality wise, hasn't really aged or anything really that badly. It's still a piece of art. We can look at years from now and be like, yeah, this is still, still, still classic material. So in my mind, that's why I say that it's a certified classic. And I think to me, when it comes to outcast, I think they actually have five. And uh, as far as certified classics, yes, I'm giving them five. And if what are their five certified classics? It's their first five albums. And I'm including Speaker Box Love Below in that. So I don't think, as I mentioned, I, when it comes to their catalog, I don't think there's a rap group out there in history that when it comes from top to bottom, from first album to last album, or most recent album that has a catalog that can, that can fuck with theirs. And I'm including Tribe Called Quest in that. I'm including Wu-Tang in that. I'm including a Public Enemy in that. I'm including EPMD in that. Gangstar. Yes. Outcast. You're right about that. You know. You're right about that. And they all have, they all have, all the groups that I mentioned have incredible catalogs. But I'm talking about quality from the drop, the drop off from one to the next is not that far between the, the five of those albums. So, yeah. so there we have it. Stank Konya. Did you hear, did you hear about uh, your boy though? Uh, Who's that? I'm taking Andre 3000 off of uh, the Nasir album. Uh, C- Cop shot the kid. Kanye took Andre 3000 off of Cop shot the kid. Nah, I didn't hear about that. <laughs> I got to look that up. Look that Somebody story played, up. Somebody uh, ex person, an uh, ex exec over there, good music, played a snippet mm-hmm. of Andre 3000 on that jump. Mm-hmm. And that's how it went to Kanye with Andre on the jump. This Bama Kanye took him off the jump. Tell you, man, the Batman ain't right, man. Something wrong with him, man. <laughs> Something wrong with him. Everybody knows Dre's kills guest verses. That's the. I mean, he kills his own verses on his own albums. When he gets on somebody else's track, he always murders it. No. So when the Jones is saying, "Man, Kanye took us something from something classic." Yeah. I see, mm. yo, this motherfucker, and he don't play the whole jump like you hear a little bit of the snippet, but you don't get yeah. to hear the full. And you know it's not mixed down, so you don't really hear the yeah the version. You hear a terrible little distorted version of it, like yo, for real, this this how you do us? Terrible, <laughs> terrible. Oh man, I really like for them to do another album, and I really think that I would love to. C- had them truly close out their catalog to do one more album produced by Organized Noise. Because if you watch the document, if, if you watch the doc, the doc, documentary, 
Rico's biggest point of contention was that they did that speaker box love below and they told them they ain't want them to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, I think to make it right, they got to do one more album with, or, with Organized Noise producing at least half of the album and then let Earth Tone 3 produce the other half, man. But, you know, but like you said, I don't think it's going to happen. Outcast is yeah, not getting back said, together. That's what they were saying. Like, yeah. You can't even find Andre 3000, let alone get him on a, on a track. Yeah, well, he said he don't want to rap no <laughs> so more, man. Him, that's, yeah. and that was the other thing they said. And for Kanye to take him off of that, off that Nas jump. Like, Terrible. Like, nigga, what the fuck is you doing? Yeah. Like, we barely see this nigga. See you no like, more. Right, exactly. But I would say on uh, Rory on Joe Budden Potter, they be just seeing that man walking around New York with a, a guitar or a flute and some shit like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... That's my wishful thinking. I would hope that they would do that, but I know it's not going to happen, though. Right, so, not happen, at all. Bro. So, there we have it. Stankonia, released 20 years ago, October 31st, 2000. Fourth album by Outkast. Make sure y'all go check it out wherever you can listen to music. Check them out on your streaming sources. Give it a listen and reminisce a little bit about, you know, the quality of this great classic that has come out. And then also, man, just to think about, you know, just how great the work Outkast did and how even deep into their catalog they were still producing hits. And that is going to wrap up yet another edition of The Vault. Please make sure you are still checking us out on our host, our new host, Red Circle. You can also get to us to all of our streaming platforms and our social media sites by going to our link tree. You go to any one of our social media sites, you can get to all of our streaming sources and all of our social media sites on that link tree. Of course, you can get to us on Instagram on at Vault CMR Podcast, on Twitter at Vault Classic. And also on Facebook and YouTube, you can search the Vault Classic Music Reviews podcast and you can get there. You can follow us, subscribe to the YouTube channel, like the Facebook page. Make sure you go and check us out. Make sure that you're interacting with us on social media. We love to interact with all of our fans and hear the feedback that you have for us. Of course, we do it here, all here for you. And make sure you're going and checking out the Raw Sex podcast. Every Thursday or Friday, you check out for that new episode with me and Dominique. Of course, we go there and we bring it to you every single week. Giving you the Fridays. real and giving just you the Fridays. raw. We just, we just going to stay on Fridays. We ain't going to give y'all two days. Just Friday. Fridays. Fridays. Make, sure, make sure y'all checking us out on Fridays. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We appreciate all the... Only fans Friday. <laughs> 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 we appreciate all the support. And if you have a friend, tell a friend. And you make sure that that friend tells a friend. Always remember to keep your headphones on and your music loud, but not too loud. And as we close, we like to remind everybody to dream big. Because dreams are the basis for creation. Always create, motivate, and elevate because you were never destined or created to stay stationary in this life. And on this note, we say peace. Thank you for listening and coming into The Vault. Please subscribe and follow us on Facebook at IV Creative and Instagram at IVECRE8.